Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our event. Uh, today is Chile in the spotlight. Um, we, as, uh, have, uh, we have a lot of uh, things to do today. Uh, between uh, you know, some of the activities, we had an extra one today. We are having a pitch session with our startups. It's going to be a short pitch. If you are in the audience, please help us to decide who has the best pitch of the event. Uh, so today, also, we are going to have white paper new white paper about Chile. This is going to be a short presentation. If you want to have this white paper, by the way, is in our website, uh, you know, under uh, the, the part of the white papers about us and white papers. And uh, uh, we are having also a good conversation with some ex experts from uh, Chile that we are going to be talking about the startup ecosystem in Chile. So my name is Mariana Sarte. I'm the CEO of Latam Startups. I'm going to admit the first startup that we'll be pitching today. So I'm going to admit uh, Mojava from Agricam. Uh, let's see when Mojava is, is actually reaching audience here. Sometimes it takes a few seconds. In the meantime, uh, guys, uh, people that are looking at the, um, uh, you know, the event, you will have this opportunity to actually, uh, you know, participate in the poll. Uh, Mojava, nice to see you. Uh, could you please share your presentation? Hello, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, go ahead. Three minutes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Mojava. CTO and uh, one of the founders of Agricom. We have a family owned group of companies which is established in 2007 and we founded Agricom in 2018 to be active in the new generation agricultural services. As you all know, farmers are using tractors and sprayers to spray and spread pesticides and fertilizers. But those methods are causing many problems as of valuable resources, losing money and workforce and they cannot having the maximum crop yield. On the other hand, there is a huge impact on environment. Tractors are producing CO2 by unprecise spraying and spreading. They can damage the soil and there is wasting a significant amount of water. And nowadays, technology can fix these kind of problems, but there is no easy way for farmers to find and use them. About three years ago, we started to solve farmers' problems by using drone-based services like spraying, spreading, and scouting. And in the process, we found out the biggest need for farmers is getting access to the high-tech services. And that was the reason we started to build our marketplace. Now we have all of our in-house services and our marketplace. In our marketplace, service providers have their high-tech services and farmers can choose the most suitable plan or services for their farm. Our, our platform will uh, connect the most efficient service providers uh, with the farmer's need, and if both sides are matched, it will finalize the contract and oversees the whole process to make sure everything is working fine for both sides. Let's take a look at some benefits of drone-based services. By using drones, farmers can save up to 50% in fertilizers and pesticides. They can save up to 50% in operation time and workforce. And they can have uh, up to 25% crop yield, and that depends on the crop types. On the other hand, drones are not producing any CO2, and they are environmental friendly. By precise spraying and spreading, uh, they can help the soil to stay healthier. And they can save up to 50% in water consumption. In the past 12 months, we finished more than 400 projects and covering approximately 250,000 hectares of farms. And uh, we can uh, make uh, more than 500 users in our marketplace. Here is a brief chart to compare our major competitors in North America. As you can see, none of them have the marketplace and no one can offer all of our services in one place. Here is the market size for Canada. In Canada, we have more than 22 million hectares of tech-friendly farmers who can be our, our customers. This is our business model. We can make money from two separate ways. First, we can make money from uh, commissions and contracts between uh, service providers and uh, farmers. And the second way, we can have profits from our in-house services. And this is the team of founders. And thank you, everyone, for your time and your attention. 
Thank you so much, Mojava, uh, for this presentation. We are going to go uh, with the second uh, general presenter this time. It's going to be Damon from K3. And after that, you know, we have another two presentations. We go for the white paper. So please help us to decide who has the best pitch of this event uh, while uh, Damon is actually entering to the room. Hi, Damon. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Damon from K3. Are you seeing my screen, right? Yes. So we are here today to talk about the Iga Solar. So Iga Solar, but Iga Solar is a sustainable powered battery equalizer for logistic industry that avoids breakdowns, double the battery life, reduces cost, environmental damage. So here we have some problems that the industry have and some solutions that we can provide. So when I spend on five years, a single truck uses 14 batteries. And if you have our product in five years, you only, you only use eight batteries. So we are preventing 72 kilos of lithium acid from harming the environment. Also, we avoid unequal consumption of batteries. We have solar panels that charge the battery even when it's composite. We save 1,824 tons of CO2 per year. We are aligned with the SDGs, uh, which is very important to us because we want to be in the future, we want to be green. So, and we have another point that is important because we have a, a sensor that turns everything off in case of fallover. So if you are involved in an accident and it can be some danger, uh, we turn everything, everything off just to keep you safe, keep the drive safe and keep your product safe. And so here we can talk about the North American market. Uh, it is involving each day. Canada has more than 700,000 trucks and the US has more than 15 and a half million trucks. So it's a perfect market for us. Uh, here we can have about uh, our pilots and clients. Uh, we have 1,525 units sold in four clients here in Brazil. And we are running 18 pilots in different clients. Uh, we have a period of test. The minimum is four months and the maximum is 18 months. So you can prove the results of our product. And here are the roadmap that we have, uh, the next steps that we are going to take in the last quarter of 2021 and in the quarters of 2022. We, we will finish the app and the 2.0 version. Uh, we want to manufacture and import the first hardware in Canada. We want to homologate partners for installation. And we want to validate the solar, uh, the solution in Canadian market with the new features that we are providing. Um, here we have uh, our major competitors. So you can see that we are the only one who has solar energy. We avoid the battery runs out of power with the reduced the cost. We have all the one solutions. We are focused on the automotive market. We have e-commerce. We have the friendly user experience. We have a modular product. So if you want to remove something or add something, we can do that. Uh, and also we have the app and the, and the sensor that turns everything off in case of all over. And here is our team. Uh, we have Sirio, Julian, and Joseline that are pioneers in the transportation industry back in Brazil. And we have George and Leo who is with us to, uh, today, and we are working on the Canada project. And uh, we want you to go green and go K3, and you can scan the, scan the career code to see our video and follow us on LinkedIn and be in touch with us with our email or website. Thank you. And thank you, Damon, for that pitch. Uh, so now we go to our next participant, that is Ramandeep from ExoWays. And after Ramandeep, we are going to have another one. And then, uh, you know, we are good uh, to uh, start with the white paper, which is going to be a good presentation. Ramandeep, please go ahead with your presentation. Yeah. Uh, can, I, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Hello everyone, this is Ramandeep Singh, founder and CEO of modules.com. So we offer fair and affordable English language test prep solution for CDLs, PTs, CELPIP and care like online exams. We have seen that 30% of test takers fail to get desired results just because of students choose untrustworthy platforms, unreliable resources, which are too costly. So we help students in their great results through our trusted platform, authentic study material at affordable pricing. Similarly, institutes have many problems like unstandardized results, operational issues, growth limitations. So we help coaching centers in their business growth through our standardized methodology, cloud-based ERP, and digital transformation of their business. So we have most trusted platform with more than 1 million plus test attempts. 
so this is the uh, erp for coaching centers to manage their day to day routine our official like testing platform for students and the study material for better results so our platform deliver unique value proposition to students and institutes like ease of management affordable pricing flexible learning proven methodology and result oriented solution our plan and packages are very affordable and flexible for students it starts with one cad uh, per practice test and for institutes it starts with 2000 cad per year so if anyone if anyone wants to join us it's very simple and easy they can just take a free trial from our website choose the plan get training and account will be activated so this is how uh, this is what our customer says about us if we talk about our journey so far we have started our uh, company in 2018 with the vision of fair and affordable testing solution in 19 we got more than 18000 student on platform and during 2020 in pandemic uh we have launched so many new services for our clients like mobile app live classes other services and 21 today we have got more than 50000 plus student across the world so this is our global presence and uh topping the chart is uh, uh, maximum students from india then after canada and followed by australia but otherwise we have got a uh, presence across the uh, world so this is the total market size out of that we are focused upon 9.6 billion english language market To, uh, our marketing strategy is very simple we spread awareness through di different uh, platforms we do b2b partnerships for the expansion purpose and improvise our product according to the market requirements this is the team behind the product so you can contact us for product experience thank you thank you ramandeep uh, so guys uh, we are entering to the last pitch of today before uh, i'm going to present here the white paper So Everton, go ahead. I'm going to add you uh, to the call. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. So hi everyone. Um, my name is Everton. I'm the CEO for Line Invests. We are a fintech based in Waterloo, Ontario. And then we really believe that everyone should enjoy the benefits of capital markets and benefit from the prosperity that those markets can offer. And they, so everyone should be investing. Uh, so for that reason, I decided to assemble a team of professionals that comes from the bank industry, from the trade industry, and also from technology to create a solution uh, that will make investment more accessible and easier for people. The good news is that, especially here in Canada, there is more people investing than ever before. Uh, there is lots of do-yourselves, uh, but still people rely a lot on advising. And then during the pandemic, uh, people are looking to find more investment opportunities, but they, they are um, trying to do it by themselves. You know, so we create something that helps them with uh, doing that, uh, getting some advising, and they make decisions that will make their life easier. Uh, we know that investing is not easy. We know that it's hard to choose because there's so many products out there. It's a little bit intimidating, you know, because if you've never done, it may be a little bit challenging to understand uh, where to go, how to make the decision. And of course, it's very hard for us as humans to make good decisions. Given that scenario, we have a robot advisor that we created that operates specifically in the Forex exchange market. And then this robot uh, works with your goals. So it works as your assistant. So the robot will learn about your personal goals. That could be a, a trip next year. That could be a dinner tonight. That could be anything. And they will make sure that that makes the smart decisions that can help you achieve the goal. So it's just like as your Google Assistant or your um, Alexa, the robot works for you as your assistant to make good investment decisions. For us, it works in a very simple way. You fill a questionnaire with your goals. Uh, we understand then your level of risk, the things that you want to achieve. Then the AI goes and it makes uh, thousands of decisions. Uh, it uses like thousands of indicators as well to make those decisions. Uh, and they, it makes sure that makes decisions that are tied up to your goal. And then you as a customer, you make money out of those smart decisions. And we only make money out of the spread of each order that is open. So we don't charge any commission or any advising fee. So for you as a customer, you're getting a, a robot that is totally personalized for you. So it's different than one fits all solution that you normally find uh, in our competitors. Um, you also getting like a robot that can do tracing high frequency. So for you, that means two things. That means that you uh, have your money available more often because the robot enters our order in one minute and leave the order. So the money is really 
readily available for you. And also means that you're less exposure, exposed to the market because you're not holding an asset for like months and months there. Okay. And then, of course, we don't charge any fees. And then we make safer because we don't use any human involvement on that. And we reduce the level of exposure, uh, as I mentioned. So if you have any questions, uh, feel, feel free like to contact me. Um, we're looking forward to uh, get to know a little bit more about you. And then also we're looking for a partner here in Canada that can help us to uh, grow the market here a little bit faster. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Everton, for that presentation. So guys, uh, in the audience, uh, those were our startups presenting today. Those startups actually are going to be presenting tomorrow uh, to apply for the startup visa program that we have phase three. So you can help us to decide who was the best pitch of the, uh, of the event. And uh, you know, in the meantime, I'm going to be uh, uh, you know, sharing uh, my presentation this time is about the um, a, a Chile in the spotlight. Everyone wants to, in this uh, event, wants to know about Chile uh, and the startup ecosystem. So this is going to be a short presentation before uh, we actually start the conversation with our speakers. Uh, so the first thing that I have to say about Chile is that, uh, you know, I'm going to start with some generalities before I actually enter to the agenda. So uh, just for you to know, Chile is traditionally considered as a model in Latin America in terms of political and financial transparency. Um, the estimated population of Chile is 19 million people uh, living as uh, the sixth most populated country in Latin America, ranking uh, its population as 63 in the world. Uh, Chile um, has become uh, one of the most urbanized Latin American societies with a uh, Bergen class, middle class. And um, uh, for you to know, it's, uh, you know, this country is overwhelming it's, it's Spanish speakers. Uh, so sometimes, you know, I have people asking me, you know, what, what do you speak in Latin America? Sometimes they hear, you know, Brazil, Portu uh, Portuguese, and, but the rest of Latin America for sure is, is Spanish. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say uh, before I present the agenda for, for this, uh, you know, white paper is that the university education in Chile is considerably uh, renowned, uh, you know, through Latin America. So it's, it's very, very good talent around. And um, uh, since the 21 century, the economy in Chile has been doing very well and significantly, significantly improving, uh, you know, for the habitants in, in Chile. So here I'm going to the agenda. So basically uh, we are going to see some of the economic um, uh, overview. Uh, we are going to talk about the startup ecosystem, technology sectors, uh, challenges and resources and introduction uh, of the speakers at the end. So as I mentioned, the speakers are coming at 12.30. So we are going to go in deep more like in a conversation with them. And what I'm going to be presenting here is just the overview of, uh, you know, uh, what is about the uh, the ecosystem and Chile in general, and why you should be looking at this country in, in particular. Uh, so coming to this part here, uh, Chile has a strong connectivity to global markets as part of over uh, 20 free trade agreements that they have, and together with Colombia, Mexico, Peru, uh, in, of course, Chile is part of the Pacific Alliance. This is very important for Canadian companies, actually, because, uh, you know, Canada is a part of the Pacific Alliance as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a point to uh, be in consideration when you are actually uh, thinking in expanding in Chile. Uh, there are so uh, there are many financial uh, incentives um, available for international companies looking to invest and do business uh, within Chile. There are tax credits are available uh, for companies uh, to undertake research and development activities in Chile, which is very important because uh, we are planning right now a bootcamp with Canadian companies going to Latin America. And Canada also has a specific fund if you are looking to uh, you know, expand in other markets and it's about research and development. So that's why I'm mentioning this here because it's going to be important for uh, Canadian companies looking at this market. Uh, so foreign investors uh, are also highlighting the access of human capital as one of the main competitive advantages. Uh, Chile has home uh, some of the best universities in the region and in the world and providing business uh, sector with a flow of high talented and capable uh, people. Uh, also, uh, Chile is one of the safest countries to do in business in, in Latin America has been the low, uh, lowest political risk in, in the region as well. Um, the other point that I wanted to make here 
is about uh, the, uh, uh, you know, Chile's regular view as uh, the most grown, best performing and most straightforward business uh, uh, situations inside the Latin America, uh, you know, region. Uh, supporting this achievement is ideal for venture conditions. Uh, so I also wanted to mention something about, you know, the situation under COVID-19. You will see some numbers also in the white paper, but just to highlight and mention uh, the economy in Chile, uh, you know, is a high income economy uh, ranked by the World Bank. Uh, and it's considered one of the most prosperous nations in, in Latin America. But of course, uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, took a, uh, took a hit on the Chilean market. Um, it, it's important, you know, like for everyone knowing that you know, this is probably something that, that everyone has to consider, uh, and I believe everyone is considering that every single country is trying to record it right now. Uh, for the numbers, we have seen that, uh, you know, uh, Chile is recording, but they contracted GDP in 6% in 2020, uh, and they are trying to, uh, you know, uh, get it over for uh, 2022 and, and going uh, towards recording. The growth expected uh, is to rebound uh, to 5.5%, um, you know, at some point of the 2021 um, and, and continue, you know, a, a growing rapid vaccination, uh, you know, in Chile. So, you know, the country also can recover, uh, you know, a, from economic perspective and uh, tourist perspective as well. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to go to the uh, next slide here. and. Um, Okay, this is about the FDIs and, and quite high quality part. So one second here. Okay, yeah, so 0.75% is the uh, central bank interest rate, uh, which is drastically uh, decreased from 1.75% uh, in early 2020, although, uh, uh, you know, the COVID pandemic was uh, happening. 6% uh, is the GDP growth uh, reported for the second half of 2020. So they really reach out the number that, uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, the 5.5% uh, 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 after, uh, you know, having a decrease in, 20, in 2020. Uh, so the other numbers that may be interested for you is the um, 5,594 million US dollars that is how much foreign investment in Chile has been increased in the second half of 2020, raising back after decreasing uh, 2397 million in the first half of 2020. Uh, so if you are interested to know the unemployment rate at this point, what we have in, in the numbers is 10.3% and 3.6% is the annual inflation rate for the second quarter of 2021. Uh, it's also worth it to know that uh, Chile is the 59 uh, a country easy uh, in doing business. Uh, this is the ranking that, you know, uh, or the position they have in 2019. Uh, so that, that will be uh, an important consideration. Um, more than that, you know, um, we are expecting again that Chile will recover, uh, you know, from uh, COVID-19 uh, very soon, uh, probably sooner than many other countries in Latin America. Um, in the specific, uh, we believe that, uh, you know, Pacific Alliance in general is very strong for uh, what we have seen. So some other, uh, you know, uh, statistics that I believe is going to be interesting. This, these ones are the ones that I already presented. Uh, so going for, for this one is more like a, about the startup ecosystem here. Uh, so this is the, the most interesting part to me. And, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to, to live in Chile for a few months uh, in 2014. And I saw how strong is the ecosystem. So uh, six years ago, Chile set out to uh, transform uh, itself into an innovation and entrepreneurial hub of Latin America. And it was a bold vision, one required, uh, you know, uh, the commitment of the government. So this is when in 2010, uh, Chile, uh, you know, uh, distributed up to $40 million to uh, 1,300 budget uh, business from almost 80 countries. Um, uh, as of last summer, those companies had generated uh, roughly uh, 1,600 jobs in Chile and 100 million uh, of dollars uh, in outside fundraising. 
so this is very important uh, for some of you also. It, there is an institution in Chile that is called Corfo, which is the Corporación Fomento de la Producción in Chile, that created the program Startup Chile. And we have one of the, I believe, early co-founders or at least early employees here, which is, uh, you know, Carolina. She may be talking a little bit more about that part. Uh, but uh, to change, uh, you know, the Startup Chile was really, um, a, as far as, uh, as we know, is to change the culture towards entrepreneurial mindset, positioning the country as a hub for innovation in Latin America. Um, Startup Chile was actually the first gover uh, governmental uh, accelerator of its kind supporting over uh, 1,600 startups with more than uh, 4,500 entrepreneurs from 85 countries. Uh, since the Startup Chile was launched, 54.5% uh, of the startups uh, accelerated, accelerated by the program are still active today. Uh, so just, just for you to know also, you know, uh, although most of the concentration of, uh, you know, the population is, is in Santiago, we also would like to highlight uh, Valparaíso and Concepción, which are centers, for example, Valparaíso is more a destination for tourism, act uh, um, artistic people, uh, you know, and, and they, they have also some universities in there. Uh, so, you know, the, the city actually has some momentum as well. And Concepcion is really the city that is more like perceived as the university capital of Chile. Uh, so uh, they, they have a startup weekend there, uh, you know, they have international conference there that are linked with the students uh, because of the type of environment uh, that they have in, in there. Uh, so now some data from the startup ecosystem. So 90% of the startups are located in Santiago. Uh, as I mentioned, Santiago is kind of the, the main concentration, but that doesn't mean that the other cities are not, uh, you know, uh, helping out here. Um, 24 venture capital investments were exited by Startup Chile as uh, of August of 2020, the largest amount in a single fund in, in Latin America. 25 co-working spaces are available for the use around the country. 28 venture capital funds are located in Chile as of June uh, 2021. And then uh, we have uh, also one Chilean company this year was declared unicorn, uh, you know, uh, for the region. And in Latin America before had like 12 unicorns in 2019, 12, 13 unicorns. Right now we have 23. So it has been a really increase of number of, uh, you know, unicorns in the region. 50% is the survival rate uh, of the startups that have received venture capital funding and 2.6 billion in USD uh, was invested in Chilean startups in the first half of 2018. Uh, so those are kind of important numbers. And really, really quick, I'm going to go here, uh, you know, for the technology sectors and I have to say my speakers are going to be way better uh, to tell me, you know, about the technology sectors here. Uh, in specific biotechnology, uh, it certainly has a momentum in, in Chile and it has been always uh, very strong. So Chile is leading player in the biotechnology industry sector worldwide. And in the country, over the uh, over 200 biotechnology companies operate in different business sectors, including health, mining and agriculture uh, so uh, some important uh, you know notes in here uh, i'm pretty sure marcus may have better uh, you know insights of this but uh, the most substantial biotechnology development uh, in chile in bio mining uh, were environmental friendly methods uh, that are used to dissolve metals overall the biotechnology sector is highly important to industries as such as health, energy, mining, and agricultural sector. Um, some other statistics about the educational uh, part in biotechnology, Chile is a country uh, with fewer than uh, 90 million uh, people, no, that has the 90 million people at least, uh, boost uh, more than 60 universities, uh, you know, uh, for uh, complex research institutions. And uh, Chile is also implementing new regulations to support and burst uh, telemedicine production uh, within medtech uh, industry and uh, you know uh, backing up a commitment uh, to fuel uh, its economy engine uh, through investment in life science uh, so we hope that that investment actually uh, show, shows up so uh, again really quick here uh, you know to start our conversation with our panelists 
uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the fintech sector. So Chile is one of the those uh, countries in Latin America that is growing in fintech. Uh, we talked before that you know Brazil and Mexico are the ones dominating the the market, but Chile is also you know putting good numbers of fintech companies in this industry. So just for you to know, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Chile has, uh, you know, an ecosystem that is, uh, you know, uh, new in, in fintech, but they are having so, some good companies in, in, in this area, in a specific in digital payments, which is one of the segments driving fintech growth in the country. Um, the rate of international startups in the region is 32%, according to the last report published in collaboration with Inter-American Development Bank, and the same rate in Chile gets as far as 53 percent uh the, this is the uh, you know the the growth potential of the uh fintech ecosystem the chilean ecosystem has become one of the most mature in the region with 69 percent of the survive rate uh, for startups with more than three years in operations um the last sector i want to talk uh and highlight is the e-commerce sector which it was not be in, in in any of our last uh you know white papers and this sector uh you know is the ter uh, chile is the 30th largest market for e-commerce with a revenue of six billion dollars in 2020 uh, of course, e-commerce has been growing really, really fast in Latin America in general, and I believe in the world uh, due to the pandemic. Chile has a tremendous mobile penetration with 95.7% uh, daily access over 100 inhabitants, where uh, over 22, 22 million internet subscribers are accessing to internet primarily through smartphones. Cyber Day is one of the annual uh, three-day events in Chile to promote online shopping. And uh, you guys can learn more about that uh, again in our white paper. Uh, so just to finalize here the presentation, because uh, we want to go and talk with our panelists, is as to talk about the challenges. And the challenges, um, I'm not going to spend too much time here, because for some of you that have been in our events, you know the challenges are more regarding the starting business, paying taxes, uh, you know, and maybe uh, making sure that uh, companies are, uh, uh, you know, in 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 good shape. Uh, let's say in registrations and property and all that. Uh, these are the same challenges that you will find in the other countries. And quiet, uh, sure, you will have a, a you know the same challenge in other emerging markets. Any country that you are going to go. The recommendation here is very similar for all of you. Just try to get in collaboration with locals. Uh, you know, uh, the language barriers is going to be there. So that's why uh, it's important that you know you you get in contact with incubators, accelerators, your trade commissioners, uh, people that that can truly actually help you. Uh, for the technology sector, I will say most of the uh, you know startups that are in this area. They speak a good level of English, so you can trust that part uh, a little bit. And then, you know, always get a personal touch. That's that's important for, for doing business anywhere in Latin America. So now I would like to introduce uh, our speakers because uh, we have some questions for them. And we just have uh, quite a half an hour with Carolina, Elias, and Marcus. So I'm going to call them here. First, I'm going to close uh, my presentation here make sure that is closing there we go and i'm going to admit carolina elias and marcus ah. hey marcus hey miriam how are you oh good hi carolina hello hi, hey marcus hi. yeah so uh, i think elias is just connecting sometimes it takes a, a few uh seconds uh for our for the other person to connect but in the meantime i'm just going to introduce you quickly and you can maybe talk a little bit more about yourself hey elias nice to see you <laughs> so, hey guys, I'm uh, carolina is an entrepreneur and she's board member early investor and advisor she's right now in europe right carolina yes i'm yeah. in rome yeah nice uh Marcus, Marcus is part of our, our board of directors, but he has actually a biotechnology uh, accelerator in Chile, and he's an investor as well. And Elias is executive director and social protection network in uh, for the Chile Ministry of Social Development and Family. I hope that I said well. 
<laughs> so, <Sorry>. okay. <laughs> okay, Elias, uh, Carolina and Marcus, we are here to talk about the startup ecosystem in Chile and why, the, you know, international companies should look at this ecosystem in particular. So I will ask you the first question, uh, you know, I, do, do you guys have like a five questions with one of the questions was about, you know, um, what is the situation, uh, you know, right now under COVID and why, you know, companies should look at the, uh, the Chilean ecosystem at this point? Anyone wants to speak about that? I want to start maybe with Marcus. Marcus, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, happy to. Um, first of all, I think um, Chile in as such has a very solid startup ecosystem and that is really thanks to the more than 10 years uh, efforts of the government to really create a movement around entrepreneurship and and i think what we could see during the pandemic were two or three things one was from my perspective that clearly um the digitalization in chile has taken an advancement like many other countries have not achieved. Like for example, I was at the same time in Germany and I, when I went into restaurants in Chile, everything was already digitalized, etc. In Germany, not. So that means it's just a small example, but it shows that, that there is an openness to really accept it. Um, I think uh, the, the other interesting development for us being in biotech was that there was the, the, the openness from the companies, that means the biotech companies which exist, which are many but many small ones, to really listen and participate was increasing. The investors are starting to get more open um, in that sense. And it's a great com country for, um, how you call that, for, for pilots. Yeah, If you want to do a pilot, uh, Chile is perfect. If you want to scale, Chile is not perfect, but Chile has definitely the, the infrastructure to pilot. Um, is it in, in digital applications? Is it in biotech, for example? Even, for example, we have, uh, we have a startup which is in diagnostics, which really piloted super well, and we are now working to scale. Um, and, and I think this combined with solid talent availability, that means if you really want to find good scientific talent, good educated talent, uh, Chile is a great place to start. So these are these are some of the elements which I would say have strengthened during the pandemic. Uh, but of course, the groundwork has been laid before. Okay. Uh, so Carolina or Elias, do you have something to add to this? Carolina, I think that you may I will, be... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to... I mean, I agree with definitely what Marcus says. I would just add, in terms of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, we're talking about a country which is unbelievable different a decade ago. Um, I had the pleasure and the, I've been the luck to be a member of the founder of Star Chile, which we, we were just a people and each one of us had a specific hand. So one of them was Seba Vidal was leading operations. Then you have Horacio, who was at that moment executive director. And actually, I was leading the startup ecosystem. My role was to build and position Chile globally as a startup ecosystem. That was my role. They paid me for that. And basically, I think um, I would take this question because one of the biggest challenges that we, that we actually face, or I personally face, because what, they were my KPIs, how do we make Chile known? How we do connect Chile? And I think that today, compared to a decade ago, Chile is internationally connected because we did the work, internationally known in the tech industry as a niche because we did a lot of effort. That was not my effort. That was Brenna Lurie who managed communication at the moment, who actually made it happen. And, and I think that all these forces that came together, uh, today you can see it in the outcome of our startups. So we have Corner Shop, who eventually did pilot in Chile, but at the end, if it wasn't, and I agree with Marcus, if it wasn't for Corner Ship to actually go and land in Mexico, it would have never probably been acquired by Uber today. Or we have the Not Company, which until today they have office in Kelin, Kelin in Santiago, um, you know, but if it wasn't for uh, Cass Adventure and Nico Berman, who is one of these amazing Argentine investors who believe in them and help them up and also in the rest of Latin America, maybe the knot will not be the knot. So, so I think that the, the, um, the, the, the solid ecosystem, which eventually sometimes can be like a wave, sometimes can be less solid, more solid than other times because of different risks, political risks, let's put it into this. This is real. Um, I think that what could mitigate or decrease the gap 
of that risk is the outcome of our of our startup and the history of our networks, which which are I think known, recognized, and we also are the force I think that will keep trying to help Chile be Chile. Okay, thank you, Carolina. Uh, Elias, do you have something to add to that? Well, I think so. Um, well, first, thanks for having me, Miriam, and hello to everybody there in Canada and all the other countries. But I'm agree with Marcus and, and, and Carolina. Um, I mean, of course, Chile is a developing country. We still have a lot of issues and a lot of challenges in terms of um, innovation ecosystem and things that we have to do as a country. Uh, but taking your, uh, I, I just I would like to add one thing. In terms of COVID-19, you say if the country is open, well, yes, the country is, is the borders are going to be open from October 1st. There are some regulations, so I, I suggest you to check the web page because you're going to have to stay in a hotel and things like that, you know, of course. And they're going to ask you if you are vaccinated or not, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's, it's like in, in many other countries. But the good thing is that the country is open. I'm located right now in Santiago de Chile, which is more or less 7 million people. It's a very active uh, capital, and we have a lot of people going on on the streets. Uh, so that's a good that's good news. I mean, in terms of economically speaking, in terms of mental health and a lot of things, the country is very open. Uh, and also, I would like to, to say that um, now, more, more or less, 15 years after the first efforts from Corfo and other institutions to start to build the, the innovation ecosystem in Chile. Uh, and I 100% agree that this is the best, one of the best locations to, to start a pilot, like Marcus said. Uh, after that, if you want to scale up your, your, your business, of course, you have all the markets that are very uh, complex, like Brazil, which is, is like, because in, in Latin America, everybody speaks about Latin America and say, okay, but except Brazil, because Brazil is other kind of thing, you know, it's so big, uh, language is different. I'm not saying that it's not relevant, of course, it's very relevant in the region. But in terms of uh, what people are looking to do after Chile is to go to Brazil, uh, Mexico, and if you graduate in Mexico, or that's like common entrepreneurs say, if you graduate in Mexico, uh, maybe you are going to be able to go for, you know, Canada and the U.S. Uh, I'm not saying that it's a rule that it's applied 100% of the times, of course, but in terms of do you have a better uh, understanding of a huge and complex market, uh, from Chile you can go to Mexico and then maybe to Europe and the U.S. and Canada. Perfect. Uh, so the other question that I have now that, you know, we all are going through, uh, you know, this part of the pandemic when countries are trying to recover, what are the type of companies do you think that, uh, you know, Chile is going to need post pandemic? So I would like to ask this question to Elias, since we finished with Elias, uh, what are the type of companies or startups that you think Chile will be look after the pandemic? Well, to be honest, that's a very good question. I've been thinking a lot and checking a lot of the, the, the data, but I would say we need startups and companies in different areas. Uh, I mean, uh, just to, to name a few one, uh, uh, we, of course we have like e-commerce companies, but maybe we have e-commerce companies more in the social sector than more like on social innovations. Uh, we need to understand that Chile is a, is a very interesting country, but we have uh, social challenges and social issues. Uh, and I work in this social innovation area, so we need more startups and more business focusing on that area. So that's one of the points. Um, there are a lot of other industry probably, and maybe Marcus and Carolina has other examples as well, but I would say that uh, we need more companies in, in food tech and issue tech and probably um, to help the state to reduce the bureaucracy, that's one of the things that is very relevant as well. And if you want to do it, of course, you need companies in those areas. Okay, perfect. Carolina, what is your opinion over, over that? Yeah. Okay, I think that to be more unique, um, not in what I say, if what Chile can actually build, maybe any company which is in, connected somehow with all the global, global climate change, change that we're seen eventually will be a really good asset. In that example, I believe there's one which is called Lemu. It's founded by Leo Prieto, who is like this really famous and well-known entrepreneur in Chile. It's like an 
a is a biofer platform that they are actually is coming alive in December. They're working with a bunch of really, really most important organizations. And there is also a movement in the sound of, of Chile in Patagonia, who is led by really relevant people from Patagonia, the brand from North Face and other American investors. So in my, I, if you tell me about a niche, that's a niche that Chile would definitely explode which is not known but believe me there is a momentum there and i know it's happening because i know it is happening that's one and then second we're gonna start to see an obvious trend which is fintech which is obvious that is not i'm not saying anything new but but what is new is that we're gonna have some fintech that are connected to insurance uh better play you know which is insurance tech which actually last week just what four if i'm not wrong there were four or five they bought six startups, I think four of them were from Chile. So there is a lot happening in the region. And I cannot agree more with Elias about the social part because there is like an, a Chilean uh, DNA is like part of our sense that every project or most of the project, which is this new generation are coming into, they have kind of a social factor, very strong social factor. It's like our flag. And I think it's kind of part of the Chilean identity. Um, and I did not believe this before. This is really important. I think I have come to this belief after seeing that you talk to amazing entrepreneurs and all of them do care about the social factor. It's not just like, this is our flag. No, it's not, it's not a marketing flag. It's like a real flag. So anything that will provide a better life or social impact, I think it will be a trend. Yeah. That, that's really good. Uh, thank you, Caro. Uh, Marcos, what is your opinion on uh, what type of a status uh, Chile needs after the pandemic? Yeah, when I when I look here on my on my cheat sheet, social impact was the first one I had. So I cannot I cannot say more than than uh, than, than you guys spoke about it. Want to but want to get a, a little bit more specific. You know, you mentioned all the digitalization, the 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 complex processes, etc. What really helps to to improve. I think I agree with all of that. And when it comes more specific to the area which I'm observing, the biotech as such, um, this year we got really several startups into the portfolio which are exactly on that one. That means they have that social part. They are focusing, uh, for example, in improving uh, soil. That means because soil is absolutely critical to CO2. Yeah, so that means um, very many, many startups are starting to focus, taking that social responsibility and, but translating it into something not only concrete for Chile, but for the world. And I think that is the other aspect which, which I see as critical. And some have started to do that, thinking about solutions which are not only just impacting Chile, but which are really impacting the world. And of course, we have seen NOTCO and, and similar ones, but I think we have the potential to see a lot more. And that's what I have seen over the last 12 months, really a shift towards having that, um, that impact element um, in the startups, but we see it also in the investor world, even though most of them are still financial first and impact second, but we see a lot of uh, that as well. Yeah, the, 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 only, the only caveat I think still is that we unfortunately see also the, the investment funds going kind of a little bit in a different direction because they start to go towards Miami. They still want to invest in Latin America, but we have seen, I think, four or five funds who have now established their main hub in Miami. So I want to be a little bit controversial here because um, that is something we also need to keep in mind that this attractiveness of Chile, we also need to continue build up the power of investment in, in Chile from Chile to, of course, global impact. No? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, so, yeah, I've seen also a lot of activity going uh, to, to Miami just recently. So I, I will agree with that. Uh, okay. So for for the another two questions and we can finish here and you guys will maybe want to do networking with our audience too. But the next question will be, uh, what are the big lessons learned during the pandemic? <laughs> because every single one has like a different type of uh, you know, experiences. Certainly, you know, I I've seen a very, uh, very good one. So uh, Carolina, uh, I will start with you. Okay. Okay. So my vision is like an outsider in the, because I did not leave the pandemic in Chile, which is 
have of value and not of value, okay? <laughs> but I think that what I saw from outside of what is happening in Chile uh, is one is the acceleration, which happened everyone everywhere, is the acceleration of the digital process in and the shift of some business model of some startups. I am a member of the board of a health startup, it's called Queiron, they are doing amazing. And basically, of course, they have always been in health, but there are many things that actually change internally because of COVID. And for them, it was really good, of course, because they were in health. But then you have other examples of other companies which I have been have that love to be mentored with and they needed to actually change the whole business model, but it was at the end positive. So I think first is the, this change of business model, which was pressured by the pandemic. That's in the startup scene. And I think nationally in Chile, and I think Elias will have a better vision than me in this, but I think that kind of like we prove kind of the world that we, we know we are a digital nation. And I would say this, and we can say that we are. Maybe we still need, of course, maybe there are some places which they still don't have the right connection, but at the end, you have the Pase de Movilidad, which is similar to the Green uh, the green Pass here in, in Europe. And you have a lot of action, which is everything online. And and even the Servicio de Impuesto Interno, which is like uh, the platform to do any, to pay taxes, uh, every work, any work. I saw my car, this is a stupid example, but I'm going to give it so then people know. I saw my car online, 100%. I didn't, from Italy to Chile, I did all my papers online. So I think we should be proud that we are in a country where digitalization is actually there and it proved that it works for the people. That, that's a really yeah. good point. That's a really good point. Marcos, uh, what was uh, the lesson learned for you during this pandemic? <laughs> um, besides the digitalization, I think it, uh, it was the possibility to prove that Chile is definitely attractive for entrepreneurs from outside of Chile. Yeah, we were able through the digitalization very quickly change everything. And we had startups from Brazil, we had startups from Venezuela, from Argentina, et cetera, who were more interested to work with us from Chile because um, in countries, for example, in Brazil, everything is Brazil focused. It's not internationally. It's not focused with a view to the outside. And I think there the pandemic helped us and many others, I know that, to really uh, prove that our vision of Chile as the starting point to international business, and international can be Latin America, can be anywhere, is the better hub and is better prepared for this. I know that other companies similar to ours in other markets struggled a lot more to really make that switch. And that is really, I think, a very good learning and an asset for Chile. Okay, thank you, Marcus. And Elias, what is your take on this? <laughs> well, I'm agree. Um, like Carolina, in my case, was very strange because I was living in the US for the last four years and I came back on March, 2020, just like a 10, days, 10 days before every, everything was closed. So it was like very strange for me, you know, that process. But um, in terms of, you know, the startup ecosystem and innovation, I would say digitization and digitalization is, is one of the best things I could say, and one of the uh, good learnings from the pandemic. Today, uh, that's, that's, that it helped us, all these problems helped us to, you know, move faster in some way. And uh, just one of uh, the very specific examples, because I've, I've been in charge of that, uh, from this Ministry of Social Development, and during the pandemic, we have, uh, because it was, we need to help the people, um, we uh, made the biggest direct transaction from the state of Chile to the pockets of the people. And that means a huge, a huge process in, in terms of change. Uh, how do you pay? How do you coordinate with the banks? Uh, how do you use the national ID number that in Chile is called RUT or ROOT? Uh, so those kind of things um, help us to do this, this, this. But, but also I would say there are other learnings, like um, there is always room to run leaner. You know, if you are an entrepreneur, that's difficult to do. But uh, I think it's one of the elements that we can uh, learn from the pandemic. Um, maybe another one, more like an, in the, the team uh, of the team building section, it's like, 
um, how to retain your true team players. And that's uh, very relevant if you are trying to uh, create your startups or maybe you are scaling up or doing that. I think that's a very good, um, as a relevant thing. Um, and the, uh, I would say, for me, those are the, the most relevant. Uh, the others are like, I, I think that it's work in process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, same here. Work in progress for, for many others. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, ask a question because uh, in the public we have somebody that is asking, uh, do you need to incorporate in Chile uh, to get the benefit of the ecosystem? What's the best way to access the Chilean market from a business structure point of view? Uh, so any of you that want to answer that? Because after that, we just have one question and we have less than five minutes. <laughs> okay, can I ask, in, 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 in general, you don't need to incorporate in Chile to get all to get the most most of the benefit. But of course, if you get one all the benefit, you should incorporate in Chile. And 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 I, and I say many benefit because Corfo, which is the agency of innovation, it provides much a lot of grants. And some of the grants are just for companies that are, of course, constituting in Chile. But you can still have your headquarters or your main company outside Chile, which is the owner of the small company in Chile. Mm -hmm. OK, OK. So uh, last question here. I'm going to start with Marcus. Uh, Marcus, what is the, uh, the main advice that you can give, for example, for Canadian companies that are looking to expand in Chile? <laughs> The main advice, business advice for them if they are looking for this move in 2022. Are you are you asking me because I'm German and I did the move or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. On, on, honestly speaking, what comes first to mind is really understand the culture. That means the business culture and of course the personal culture um, because uh, business culture in Chile, in Latin America in general, but don't think Latin America everywhere it's the same. It's different in every single Latin American country. But it is specific um, in the sense that um, you need more patience. That is the one. You need more patience because uh, things are slower. It's just the nature of it. Um, so just the, the simple example which I always bring, uh, a meeting, when you set meetings with U.S. and with, with U.S. investors, with U.S., business people, you set a meeting of 30 minutes or 45 minutes maximum. In Chile, it's always one hour. Nobody even considers meetings which are 30 minutes. So, um, and, and this time is usually used to build that relationship. So you really need to start to build the relationship, which brings also the second part, which goes in the same direction, but when you really consider it, try to find a trusted partner who goes with you. That means someone who is in Chile, that can be when you're a startup, it can be Startup Chile. It's, an, it's a fantastic entry point because they also help you with a lot of the administrative questions you have. But if you are more an advanced business, then uh, then then you, you need to look, you know, is there a, a company which you want to partner with? Is there someone who is in your business environment who is in Chile, who has that experience? I only can recommend find someone with whom you do it. Otherwise, it will be it will be challenging. That's true. Carolina, what is your advice? Uh, you work with a lot of international companies when you were in instead of Chile. Yeah, my, my first advice is always partner with a local, which is obvious, but it's really important. So that's one thing. One, I think the second one would be understand the difference in negotiating and dealing with Chileans compared to other Latin American countries. And I do, I grew up in Brazil and I have been and that's like, I'm not Brazilian, but I kind of, I know the difference is that is really, really broad between doing business in Brazil and in Chile. I have worked with, in Peru, you know, I have worked in Peru, I have worked in Argentina, and I think we all have our differences, which are super, some of them are subtle, but some of them are really, really important to actually know because they're really different between each other. One of the biggest difference is that I do believe, and okay, maybe it's subjective, but I do believe that Chileans tend to say what they actually do more than other Latino, which you can talk for longer. And I do agree with Marcus because maybe German is like the other stream. I work a lot, not with Germany, but with Austrians, which are all similar, but no, I know they're not the same. And it's different, yes. But you, we need to be aware of this difference of the like matrix of, of, of Latinos, which is different. So that's my second 
point, which is fundamental, because if not, you're not going to enter in the right way. And then I think the third one would be, it all depends what you want to do. So, of course, I would love that everybody would go to Chile, but don't go to Chile if there is not a pillar that will push you to go to Chile. If you do social innovation, yeah, open, go to Chile. If you do energy, go to Chile. If you, if you eventually want to, I don't know, open a, a com, an e-commerce in the region, yeah, eventually you can pilot Chile and then run, jump to Argentina or to Brazil. But think about why would you go to Chile. Uh, that's my third recommendation. Okay, thank you, Carolina. And Elias, uh, as you mentioned, you you live outside of Chile for many years. You have also deal with uh, you know companies uh, coming to Chile. What is your best advice for them? Well, my first one is like what Marcus says. Well, be patient. Things works here, but at a different speed. I think that's the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one, if you want to come here and you're dealing with your Spanish, don't worry. You're going to have a lot of problems here speaking Spanish because unfortunately, people in Chile don't speak uh, the best Spanish in the region. So that's uh, for sure. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. For sure. And you know that, Miriam. <laughs> I know, but, uh, but um, I got I got the, <laughs> the some of the vocabulary at least. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Um, one of the good things, of course, and this is probably uh, different uh, because, like you said, I've been dealing with different ecosystem in the region for uh, it, since I was working based in Washington D.C. I work for more with more than fifteen countries in Latin America, and one of the good say I, I can say about Chile is that, um, and I mean, full disclosure here, my, my, my dad is Greek, so I grew up in a Greek, a Greek family. So when you say no in Greece, it's not the no in Chile. I mean, here is real no. <laughs> so uh, those kind of things, I think are, are relevant to, you, you know, to manage your business here. Um, another thing that you probably are watching the news, the country is changing, it's been changing, it's working to change their constitution. And that probably, that's obviously that brings some, you know, some questions about what is going on in the country. Uh, but also it opens an opportunity in terms of what is going to happen and the opportunity to bring, you know, different businesses that probably can take those opportunities. And that's very relevant. Um, Chileans also a, a little bit, you know, they show off a little bit. I mean, in terms of, look, we are an OCD country, we have this, we have that. Um, to be 100% honest with, with you guys, Chile don't look too much the region. They prefer to look the US, Canada, and some countries in Europe. Uh, I'm not saying that it's the best, but it, it happens in terms of the innovation ecosystem. Um, one of the good things is the time zone. You're going to have like pretty much the same time zone that in Canada or in the East Coast in the U.S. So those things, are, I think, are relevant if you're planning to come here. And especially if you have an energy company or a mining company or uh, those specific, uh, I think this is a good place to, you know, to come here, to take a look, to have a, a you know, better understanding of the ecosystem and the industry that is working in that because it's growing up a lot. Uh, and I think that's a very good opportunity for all of, all of you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Ria. Uh, I have a last question, and I know people are already going to networking because I see them already doing networking. Uh, but I wanted to ask this question for Marcus because it seems like it's more related with, uh, you know, um, venture capital or venture in, in general. Um, yeah. Are there any government programs for attracting partnering with international venture builder accelerator investment funds programs? Um. There are there are um, programs uh, in regard to building a venture fund, um, which is called early stage funds. I think they're called FET, um, where um, where you can create an administrator. You need to have an administrator in place, which is registered in Chile, um, and with that you need to bring a certain amount. Uh, I mean, you present, of course, your 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 business plan for that specific fund, and if accepted by Corfo, then you can have a um, a balance. That means where you have you bring, for example, one, and the government brings two or three times that money 
to your fund. Of course, there are conditions that is subject to certain uh, return models, including that you need to pay interest, etc. But it's very attractive when you start building a fund. Um, with certain limitations. Of course, there is a priority of investments in Chile. I don't have the actual settings. I'm not sure, Elias, if you know that um, in the past there were more or less no possibility to invest that money internationally. I've heard there's some changes in, in those regulations, but um, absolutely there are programs which are supporting the building of uh, of investment funds. I'm not sure if there are still accelerator support programs. We have never received that because our model is boutique and boutique is not what uh, Corfo is looking at. Corfo is looking more at volume. So therefore, uh, we don't fulfill that. We are completely private. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe, maybe I'm just to add one thing that, like Marcus said, there is uh, one initiative that's still discussing in the Congress. It's the fund of funds, which is the idea to have like this, you know, uh, this big funds to to create, you know, a better VC or different instrument of, of finance new startups. That's one of the things, um, and I think that's that's very relevant because the idea is to use pension funds or like one percent of the pension funds to invest in different kind of companies. In this case, like startups. That is going to take a, a while. Maybe 2022, we're going to see some changes in that. But that is a very good initiative, and some of the VC funds, uh, local VC funds, and the entrepreneurship association are, you know, are pushing that in the Congress. Correct. Okay. Th thank you so much, Elias and Marcus, for that answer. Uh, guys, uh, the time is up uh, already. Uh, so if you want to go again to networking that already, I have some people there. Uh, you, you can go and network maybe with the audience. Uh, but I would like to okay. thank you, uh, Marcus Schrager, uh, Carol Rossi, and uh, Elias Stefarikis for being here. Uh, so uh, this video is actually going to be available, uh, you know, very soon uh, in our YouTube channel. Uh, so we can, uh, you know, you can review maybe the questions, uh, or maybe the white paper that you can actually download in, uh, you know, in our website about the Chilean startup ecosystem. And I just want to mention just uh, uh, finalizing this part is that, um, you know, we'd like to thank our sponsors, OVH Cloud, Bright Immigration and Ocean Law for the support uh, in the Latin American Spotlight series. The next uh, Latin American Spotlight will be Peru, Peru in the Spotlight. So I hope everyone has a very good networking session. If uh, you have, if you are a Canadian company looking to Latin America, just remember we have a bootcamp in November uh, that will help you out to find those markets and those partners in Latin America. Thank you, everyone.